I remember a time when I was a teenager and a fairly new Christian where I was uh, sitting on my bed and reading Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 37. And I remember that after reading this passage, that I was left with a deep sense of worry and concern. Uh, Why was I worried? Why was I concerned? Well, I had uh, read in this passage about an unforgivable sin, the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that's the idea of speaking in ways that are highly offensive about the Holy Spirit. And at the time, I, I was left wondering, oh, is that a sin I've committed? Now, I didn't think that I had, uh, you know, intentionally committed such a sin, but I was, I was more concerned, was this something that maybe I had accidentally done uh, at some point in my life? I, I, was, I was troubled by that. But friends, uh, this morning as we uh, look through Matthew 12, verses 22 to 37, what we are going to see is that this unforgivable sin, this blasphemy against the Spirit, it is not a sin that you commit accidentally. It's not a a sin that uh, you commit unwittingly. No, it is actually a willful sin. It is very much an intentional sin as opposed to an unintentional one. And the other thing I, I want to assure you of as we look at this passage is that this sin of blasphemy against the Spirit is a sin that you certainly do not commit if you are trusting in Jesus, if you are believing in him and following him and seeking to live for him. So it's it's certainly not an unintentional sin, it's a willful sin, and it is very much a, a sin that you do not commit if you are trusting in Jesus. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to work uh, through this passage, through Matthew 12, 22 to 37, to uh, help us to understand in context uh, what this unforgivable sin is. And as we look at this passage, what we are going to see at the end is that there are three key lessons that emerge from this passage uh, for us when it comes to living life today. Well, let's work our way through this passage now, and this brings me to my first point for this morning, which is this, that the Pharisees claimed that Jesus' power had an evil source. Uh, Have a look at uh, Matthew 12, verses 22 to 24. We read, Then they brought him, that is Jesus, a a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So we have a a situation where Jesus has before him a man who is demon-possessed, a man who is controlled by a demon. And let me tell you that there is nothing good at all about demon possession. It always results in an awful life for the one who was demon possessed. And in the case of uh, this particular person, they could not uh, see and they could not speak as a result of this demon possession. Well, friends, Jesus casts this demon out of the man. And the result is that this man who could not see can now see. The man who was mute could now speak. And obviously the the power on display here was very, very significant because people who are witnessing this event say, could this be the son of David? Could Jesus be the son of David? Now, friends, the, the son of David is another way of talking about the Christ or the Messiah. Uh, In 2 Samuel chapter 7, King David was promised that one of his descendants would be a king, a powerful king who would rule forever. And uh, this king came to be known as the son of David. And the Jewish people were eagerly awaiting the time when this son of David would come and defeat their enemies and bring the kingdom of God into effect. Well, here the people see this powerful miracle 
and they say, could this be the son of David? Well, friends, they are certainly very right uh, to think that Jesus was indeed the son of David because he was. He was the fulfilment of that great promise to King David. But the Pharisees, upon hearing the people say this, well, they're deeply disturbed. Remember that what we've seen over the last few weeks is that the Pharisees do not like Jesus. So much so that they've actually been plotting how to kill him. And they hear this talk about uh, Jesus maybe being the son of David and they want to hose it down straight away. And so they respond by saying, no, he's not the son of David. No, he's not even really from God. No, the power that Jesus has to do what he's just done doesn't come from God. It comes from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. The source of Jesus' power is Satan. The source of Jesus' power is the evil one, is the claim that they are making. Now, friends, this is not the first time that uh, this claim has been made against Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. We see it in chapter 9, verse 34. But unlike there, here in Matthew 12, Jesus responds to this claim of the Pharisees. And this brings us to our next point which is that Jesus exposed the problems with the Pharisees' claim. The Pharisees claimed that Jesus was able to do this great miracle because he received power from Satan, the evil one. Well, Jesus highlights the fact that there are three very significant problems with that claim. And the first problem is this. The Pharisees' claim was illogical. In Matthew 12, verses 25 to 26, we read, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Jesus is basically saying here that what the Pharisees are claiming is, is totally illogical. So think about it this way, right? The demon-possessed man was under the power of Satan. By casting the demon out of this man, Jesus actually frees this man from the power of Satan. And, and as Jesus frees people from the power of Satan, Satan's kingdom gets smaller and smaller and is diminished. And Jesus' point is this, why would Satan empower someone to actually make his kingdom smaller? Friends, there is nothing good about Satan. Satan wants to have as many people as possible under his power. He wants to take as many people as possible to hell with him. He doesn't want to let go of people. And, and Satan is no dummy. Satan is very crafty. He's very smart. He's very wily. And there is no way in the world that he would allow someone to use his power to diminish his kingdom. It just does not make sense. It is just not logical to claim that Jesus is freeing people from the power of Satan by using the very power of Satan. Satan loves having power over people. He will not let go of people if he can avoid it at all costs. What the Pharisees are claiming is illogical. It makes no sense. In verses 28 to 29, Jesus actually spells out what is going on. We read, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. You might remember when we looked at Matthew 12, verses 15 to 21, we saw that uh, Jesus is the servant who is promised in Isaiah 42. And in Isaiah 42, we are told that this servant has the Spirit of God upon them. Indeed, at Jesus' baptism, the Spirit descends upon Jesus. 
And as uh, Jesus performs this great miracle, uh, casting this demon out of this man, enabling him to be able to see and to speak, Jesus says that what is actually happening here is that the power of the Spirit of God is at work through him to bring about that miracle. Jesus is demonstrating that he is this servant whose task was to come into the world and to enable justice to be victorious, to provide the nations with hope. Now, how does Jesus enable justice to come to victory? Well, by defeating Satan, by taking away Satan's power over people. Remember that Satan is the father of lies. Uh, he is a, a force of evil in this world who is at work to make sure that injustice abounds. Well, friends, Jesus provides victory for justice ultimately by defeating Satan. And he enables people to have hope by freeing people from the power of Satan. And so when Jesus talks about the spirit of, being at work here, the kingdom coming. It's all about this mission of the servant. Jesus is fulfilling this mission of the servant to bring justice to victory because he is tying up the strong man, Satan. He is plundering his house by freeing people from his power. Friends, Satan never acts for the good of others. What was Jesus doing? As he cast this demon out of this man, he was acting for his good. The most logical explanation is not that Jesus' power was from Satan, but that it was the power of the Spirit of God at work in him, bringing about this good situation for this man. See, the problem with the Pharisees' claim, it was simply illogical. It made no sense. It made no sense at all. But it wasn't just an illogical claim. What we see also is this, that the Pharisees' claim was inconsistent. Matthew 12, verse 27, we read, And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Now, it just so happens that uh, people who were approved by the Pharisees, that the Pharisees thought were good, were also in the business of casting demons out of people. Maybe not in the particularly powerful way that Jesus was doing, but they were still in that business. And Jesus says, listen, Pharisees, I don't hear you accusing these people of having power from the evil one to do this. So why do you accuse me of that? You're not being consistent. If you're being consistent and you're saying that I only can do this because of the power of the evil one, then you should be accusing these other people of the same thing. But you don't. And the fact that you accuse me of being able to do this because of the power of the evil one, well, that will result in those others judging you and criticising you, says Jesus. The Pharisees' claim was illogical. It was inconsistent. But thirdly and most importantly, the Pharisees' claim was blasphemous it was blasphemous and here's where we come to this uh, uh, idea of the unforgivable sin in Matthew 12 verses 30 to 32 whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters and so I tell you every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven anyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Uh, Jesus makes it clear in verse 30 that as the Pharisees speak against him, that they are actually conspiring against his mission. Conspiring against his mission to free people uh, from the power of the evil one and to give them hope. But you might have noticed in this passage that uh, Jesus talks about sin that is forgivable, but sin that is unforgivable. He talks about how words spoken against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but blasphemy or offensive words spoken against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Now, 
that can leave us a bit confused. We can kind of wonder at this point if Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is somehow more important than him because he is this son of man. Is that what is being said there? Well, no, I don't think that's what is being said. What I think Jesus is referring to here is the difference between a sin committed in ignorance and a sin committed willfully. So it's the difference between a sin committed in ignorance and a sin committed willfully. Um, a number of years ago, uh, Alison and I uh, lived in an apartment in Parramatta. And it was an apartment, we were on the 11th floor of this apartment. It was one of those apartments where you couldn't get in uh, unless you had a key or unless you were buzzed in. And, and we, we never got junk mail as a result. People just couldn't get junk mail in. We never got community newspapers. And we didn't at that time have a TV. Now, one day in the mail, I got a, a letter from the Australian Electoral Commission uh, fining me and fining Alison for not having voted at a, a council election. It seems that there was some kind of special one-off council election in, in the Parramatta Council at that time. But you see, the thing was, because we lived in this building, because we didn't watch TV, uh, because we didn't get community newspapers, because we didn't get junk mail, we actually didn't know this election was on. We were totally ignorant of it. And so I actually wrote to the Australian Electoral Commission and said, look, we don't have a TV, we're in this building where we don't get you know, junk mail, community newspapers, etc. We didn't know about this election. If we'd known, we would have voted. Please forgive us this debt. And taking our situation on board, they forgave the debt. We didn't have to pay the fine. Now, friends, this idea of the word spoken against the Son of Man is a bit like, you know, Alison and I not voting <laughs> uh, at the council election. This sin against the Son of Man is one of ignorance. How so? Well, remember we read from Daniel 7, uh, this great prophecy about one like a Son of Man who receives all glory, authority and sovereign power from the Ancient of Days. Uh, we know that Jesus is this Son of Man. But friends, to this point of time, Jesus had not yet received all that glory, authority and sovereign power. It was, it was not clear beyond all doubt that Jesus was indeed this Son of Man. And so if people sort of uh, refuted his claims or rejected his claims to be the Son of Man at that point, when it hadn't been revealed in all of its fullness, well, Jesus says that sin can be forgiven. That sin can be forgiven because it is a sin of ignorance. The blasphemy of the Spirit, however, we are told, is not like that. It is a willful sin. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's a lot of frustration uh, in our community about people who are simply not obeying the rules that our government has uh, told us to obey. Uh, when I go out walking too regularly, I see people walking around without face masks on. Now, friends, that's not an ignorant thing that they're doing. It has been made very clear to us that if you're outside, particularly in areas like ours, you must wear a face mask. And so when those people are fined, uh, they're not going to get out of the fine because they are committing a willful act of rebellion. Well, friends, the, this uh, idea of blasphemy against the Spirit is like that. Friends, Jesus hadn't been revealed clearly as the Son of Man to this point. But in this exorcism, the power of the Spirit certainly had been revealed very, very clearly to all who were there. So much so that people who were there said, this could be the son of David that we have here. They acknowledged this is God at work. There was no doubt in their minds that this was God at work. This was the, the logical explanation of this clear revelation of the power of spirit, the spirit at work. And so the problem with the Pharisees wasn't that they were ignorant. They saw clearly what was going on here. And, and the only logical explanation was that this was the power of the spirit at work. And even though they saw this clearly, and even though they knew that this was the only logical explanation, 
They refused to believe. This was not a sin of ignorance. It was a willful refusal to believe. And Jesus says that it was motivated by hearts that were evil. Look at verses 33 to 37. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Uh, Friends, this blasphemy against the Spirit on the part of the Pharisees was not due to ignorance, but because their hearts were full of evil. Out of evil hearts come evil words. And these words saying that it was by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that Jesus performed this miracle were evil words that came from an evil heart. Friends, notice this was not an accidental sin. It was not an unintentional and unwitting sin on the part of the Pharisees. It was deliberate. It was intentional. It went against the very clear evidence of what God revealed by the power of his spirit. And notice, friends, that uh, this is not a sin committed by those who trust in Jesus. No, this sin was committed because these Pharisees hated Jesus and were rejecting him. Now, friends... As we look at everything that uh, goes on here in Matthew 12, verses uh, 22 to 37, what are we to take from this for our situation today? What are we to take for this for our situation today? Um, As we think about the unforgivable sin and all that, how, how does all of that apply to us today? Well, this brings us to our final point, which is this. Three key lessons to take away from Matthew 12, verses 22 to 37. Three key lessons to take away from Matthew 12, verses 22 to 37. And the first of these lessons is this. You are either for Jesus or against him. You are either for Jesus or against him. Matthew 12, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus is very clear in this verse that there is no sitting on the fence when it comes to him. You're either for him or you're against him. And the truth of the matter is that if you are against Jesus, you are in a dangerous position because Jesus is the judge of all people. He will return at a time that we just do not know. And at that time, we're all going to have to stand before him and to give an account for how we have lived in his world and responded to him. Now, those who have confessed with their mouths that Jesus is their Lord and Saviour will be acquitted on that day. But those who have rejected Jesus will be condemned. There's no sitting on the fence with Jesus. You're for him or against him. And if you're against him, you will be condemned. And so I urge you, turn to Jesus. Turn to him before it's too late. And for those of us who are for Jesus, remember, we have a mission to help those who are against Jesus to hear the good news so that they can be spared the condemnation they deserve. So look at your your family, your friends, your colleagues who who do not follow Jesus. You might look at them, you think they're nice people. Uh, They respect the fact that I believe what I believe, but they just choose to believe something else. Don't be content with that. Because they are against Jesus and are facing condemnation. Help them to come to know Jesus. Pray that God would give you opportunities to help them to come to Jesus, that he would enable you to speak the truth clearly to them. Because there's no sitting on the fence with Jesus. You're for him or against him, and if you are against him, you will be condemned. Second important lesson that emerges from uh, Matthew 12, 22 to 37 is this. 
No sin is unforgivable if you accept Jesus. Matthew 12, 31. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, we've already heard that uh, if you follow Jesus, that you're not committing this unforgivable sin. If you follow Jesus, though, notice what this passage is also saying. That all the sins that you have committed, past, present and future, are now forgiven. Are now forgiven. You might be someone at this point who doesn't follow Jesus and, and you think about your life in the past or what's going on in your life at the present and you might think, God would have nothing to do with me. But Jesus makes it clear, your sins can be forgiven. Indeed, friends, the whole reason why Jesus went to the cross was to make it possible for us to be forgiven. On the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. The Bible is very clear that the reason why Jesus died was so we can be forgiven. And friends, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, past, present and future. You might think your sin is bad, but Jesus took the punishment it deserves. And so you can now be forgiven as a result. Remember, you are either for Jesus or against Jesus. If you're against Jesus, you will be condemned. But if you are for Jesus, you won't be condemned because all your sins will be washed away. All your sins will be forgiven. And as a result, you can look forward to spending eternity with God. You can have hope now. Now, the third key lesson that comes out of uh, Matthew 12, verses 22 to 37, is this. A willful rejection of Jesus is the result of an evil heart, not problems with the truthfulness of the claims about Jesus. Remember that uh, the, the, the Pharisees had very clear evidence of the power of the Spirit of God at work. Yet despite the fact that they had that clear evidence, they said, this is evil. Why? It wasn't ignorance. It was a willful decision made by an evil heart. Well, friends, today, we have the opportunity through the scriptures to be able to understand very clearly who Jesus actually is. That he is God that uh, he is the judge who is to come, that he is the saviour who died on a cross in our place to make it possible for us to be forgiven. Friends, we can understand clearly from what the Bible says who Jesus actually is. And there's lots of opportunities to be able to discover who Jesus actually is. And so if, if you read the Bible and you understand who Jesus is, you can't plead ignorance because God reveals very clearly who Jesus is and the significance of him and how we can be forgiven through him. Now, you might say, okay, well, sure, I understand the claims of Jesus, but what if this is just all a fairy tale? You know, is this actually true? Well, you might then look at the evidence for Jesus at this point. And I want to suggest to you that when you look at history, and you look at uh, the existence for Jesus' life and death and resurrection, it is actually really, really strong. It is really, really strong. Uh, many of us, for example, would assume that, uh, you know, Alexander the Great existed or Julius Caesar existed. There's more evidence to suggest that Jesus existed than those two gentlemen. Let's go to the resurrection of Jesus for a moment. That's really the event upon which Christianity stands or falls. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, he didn't die in our place. If Jesus uh, wasn't raised from the dead, then he really isn't God, right? That's the event upon which Christianity stands or falls. Now, the majority of ancient historians acknowledge something happened on the first Easter Sunday to cause uh, the emergence of the Christian church. 
Not all of them will say that it was Jesus being raised from the dead, but they all acknowledge something happened. The most plausible explanation, historically speaking, is that Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, Again, the claims from the Bible are clear. And when you look at the evidence from history, the evidence about Jesus is compelling. You might say, oh, but is the Bible actually a reliable book? Well, again, as we saw in our sermon series about the Bible earlier this year, uh, the Bible hasn't changed. Uh, There's good reason to accept that the Bible is actually a reliable book, right? So the claims about Jesus are clear. The evidence uh, for his existence, his life, his death, his resurrection is is, is very good. Uh, Historically speaking, the Bible is actually a reliable book, right? So you've got all of these things. It's actually quite compelling. Yet people still refuse to believe in spite of all of these things. And I'd want to suggest to you that a person who refuses to believe having understood the claims of the scriptures, having looked at the evidence for Jesus' life and having investigated the reliability of the Bible are no different to the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They are no different. They are making a decision, not based on logic. They are making a decision that is based upon evil in their hearts. It can be uh, discouraging when you uh, share the good news of Jesus with others, uh, when you show them the evidence that they still refuse to believe. The problem is not with the message and it's not with the evidence. The problem is with the person's heart. And so if you're a person who keeps refusing to believe in Jesus, I want to say to you, examine your heart. Are you actually truly open to the claims about Jesus and the evidence for him? Are you truly open? Because if you were truly open, I would suggest to you that you would accept Jesus. So come to it all with an open mind and an open heart. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, don't be discouraged when people reject the good news. Keep proclaiming the truth. Keep showing the evidence and pray that God would be at work in the hearts of those that we are trying to reach. For only God can change an evil heart. We can't. So in Matthew 12, verses 22 to 37, we see that Jesus is powerful, supremely powerful. And indeed, he uses his power to defeat Satan to free people from the power of Satan so that they can be forgiven of their sins and have the hope of eternal life. Praise God for the power of Jesus. Praise God that he enables us to be freed from the power of the evil one. But remember with Jesus, you're either for him or against him. There's no sitting on the fence. And those who are against Jesus are still under the power of the evil one and will be condemned. But those who accept Jesus, well, they will be forgiven. They will have life and hope. So if you're yet to accept Jesus, open your hearts. Open your hearts to his claims. Open your hearts to the evidence. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, keep proclaiming the truth, no matter how people respond, and keep praying that God would work on people's hearts so that they might indeed believe. Amen.